So I just want to thank you all for coming out this evening, and I think we have a really interesting talk ahead of us. Of course, uh, most of you know Dr. Peggy Leschker Denton. She's the director here at the museum. And she actually worked with the museum for 16 years prior to her appointment as director <laughs> as an archaeologist. And she worked on a lot of the major maritime archaeological sites in the Cayman Islands, including the Wreck of the Ten Sail. Um, and of course, um, we've just given you guys copies of the Maritime Heritage Trail maps for Grand Cayman as well as the Sister Islands. And that was actually a joint initiative between the museum, the National Trust, <coughs> DOT, and... Uh, National Archive and the National Department Archive. of Environment. And Department of Environment. <laughs> my mind all of them. Okay, so I'll give it over to Dr. Peggy now, and yeah, enjoy. Thank you, Maya. <laughs> and thank, thank you everyone for coming out this evening. It's nice to see a, a pretty big crowd for our intimate gathering room here. <laughs> it's good to know there are some people who do care about our maritime heritage. It's so important for the Cayman Islands. Uh, Maya, may I have the lights down? We're going to just put the lights down. Okay, so can everyone um, see well? All right. Uh, what we're going to talk about today is we're going to be on the trail of maritime heritage in the Cayman Islands. So what are the Cayman Islands? We all live here. Sometimes in other places of the world, I have to kind of show them. But uh, what's really important here to notice is that we really are the tip tops of great mountains. And just the very tip tops of those mountains protrude above, above the sea. And that makes us pretty <coughs> unique. We're fairly isolated out in the Western Caribbean. So we could be used as landmarks. We could be used as, we, we could be hazards to navigation. Um, but whatever we are, there we are, out in the Western Caribbean Sea, on the edge of, a, of one of the continental plates. So we had being, actually, let me go back there, because one point I wanted to say here was, uh, as an isolated landform, um, being that at this stage we have not found, found signs of prehistoric presence in the Cayman Islands, doesn't mean that it doesn't exist, but it means that we have not found it so far. It appears that the Cayman Islands were a unique natural environment, untouched largely by human beings before um, Europeans started to coming, coming by in the 1500s. So that means we have very um, unique flora and fauna that exists nowhere in the world. So when the Europeans did start sailing across the oceans, across the Atlantic, uh, the Spanish, the Dutch, and the French, uh, they, they came following ocean currents that went in a big circle. Um, they came from Europe, across the coast of Africa, across the Atlantic, and entered the Caribbean Sea. Um, then the ships would often um, then go through the Yucatan Channel and follow the currents back to Europe. That ends up being the sailing routes because the pre prevailing wind and ocean currents would take them that way. So who were our earliest visitors? Well, the first that we know of at this stage is Columbus, who on the 10th of May in 1503, which I guess that's 510 years from now this coming Friday, uh, passed by the Sister Islands on his fourth voyage. Now, he was in distress. It was uh, at this point, he had leaky ships and he was off course. <laughs> he was trying to get to Hispaniola. And so he sighted these two landforms that he had not seen before. And his son Ferdinand wrote in his log that the, they sighted two small islands uh, with so many turtles about that they looked like little rocks in the sea. So to a navigator, that would be, you know, hazard. Um, but it also ended up showing on, up on maps, you know, subsequent to that as landmarks. And of course, very importantly, food. So the next visitor that we know of, the next uh, major principal European visitor, would be Sir Francis Drake, who uh, in, on the 22nd of April, 1586, actually stopped in the Cayman Islands for two days. He was on a voyage, an, in, an interloper into what the Spanish called the Spanish Main. And they were um, traversing and uh, exercising their rights in the area. So they actually stopped and they took turtles, they took um, iguanas, they took all kinds of beasts, and they couldn't find any water on the island. And so they set the island afire and they left. <laughs> so anyway, nice guys, you know. 
Um, over five centuries of maritime heritage, however, exist here in the islands, and I would say five centuries of maritime cultural heritage. Looking backwards, there's, you know, millennia probably of, uh, of um, maritime environmental type natural heritage. So pre-1500s, the islands were largely untouched natural history place. Much like the Galapagos, we may not have creatures as large as the Galapagos, but we certainly have species that exist nowhere else in the world. Um, from the 1500s, hazards, landmarks, turtle fishing grounds, we've already discussed some of those aspects. 1600s to the 1730s, the islands are still used as fishery encampments. English settlement begins, particularly after 1655 when the uh, uh, British take Jamaica. It's an era of privateers and pirates in the Spanish Main. And of course, being so close to Port Royal, Jamaica, the English in Port Royal were a, running a privateer sort of uh, system for um, keeping the English stronghold in this middle of the Spanish Main. In the 1700s, I'd say it's more like sugar and wars. Um, this, we were the theater of European countries uh, vying for control of the sugar industry. And the major player, players in this time period were the French and the, and the British. And then the Spanish and the, the Dutch would be kind of inconsistently aligned with either of those. In the 1800s, the turtle fishing industry continues. Merchant trade flourishes and emancipation comes to the islands in, in 1835 uh, via ship from Jamaica. In the 1900s and into up to the present day, fishing continues, merchant trade continues. Uh, the world wars, of course, happened in our area. We had uh, we had German submarines, you know, <laughs> around our islands. Um, we had a we had a vessel that was destroyed, a merchant vessel that was destroyed by a German submarine just off the southwest coast of the of Fran Cayman. Captain Paul Hurlston can tell us all about it. He saw the smoke ball and uh, knows a lot of the history of that. But anyway, uh, and today, of course, tourism is flourishing and it's based largely on our beautiful, unique maritime position. So what kind of sites might we have on the island when we think of archaeology? Um, archaeology deals with the physical remains of uh, the people's past. And so what, where would we find clues? Well, we had shipwrecks on these islands. We had places ashore where people would come and they would be salvaging uh, their shipwrecks from those places on shore. There were anchorages where uh, ships would come to, uh, to, you know, to, well, to anchor as they do today. We still have cruise ships anchoring out in our harbors. Careening places, well, what's a careening place? That's a place where you would uh, bring your ship in, you would haul it over kind of partly on its side, you would scrape the barnacles off the bottom and clean up your ship. And you'd repair the bottom, the hull. Forts, well, we don't have grand, great, big forts, but we certainly do have um, smaller forts around Grand Cayman. We had a fort at Prospect. We had a fort at Georgetown uh, before it was sort of landlocked <laughs> by the modern, modern day port. Uh, but these forts were um, important for the island and the, the fort at Georgetown was actually destroyed probably in the American Revolutionary War. There was a small uh, fort there because in the 1802 census, the, um, the, the Edward Corbett talks to the local people who say that they were, that the fort had been destroyed in the previous war, which I believe is probably the American Revolutionary War, and that they were not bothered on any quarter in the most recent war, which would be the French Revolutionary Wars. Lighthouses, well, not big conventional lighthouses that we might think of, but we certainly have beacons around our islands. Um, shipbuilding and launching sites. Many Caymanian families made a living by building ships and then sailing in the merchant uh, trade with those ships. Um, maybe we can't see the locations where these ships were built on land so much anymore, but, but if you go around the island and you look and you will see cuts in the iron shore, these are places where the ships, the, or the ships were launched. Hurricane shelter caves, there's, you know, around, especially around uh, Cayman Brac. These were very important in the history of the island for um, seeking shelter from maritime tragedies and disasters like hurricanes. Uh, maritime communities and uh, uh, architecture around all of the Cayman Islands and maritime industry. 
So just, uh, I won't to belabor this too much, but the foundations of maritime archaeology, it's stunning to me, <laughs> were laid three decades ago. Um, in 1979 to 1980, the Institute of Nautical Archaeology came to the island at the request of the government, and they surveyed all three of the Cayman Islands in those, um, it, during the, the summers of those years, and they recorded 77 sites. And um, I was actually on the 1980 expedition. <laughs> so was Dennis over there. My husband, we met on that project, which is kind of a, a side. Um, but anyway, then Laws established the National Museum also in 1979. Um, the National Trust was established in 1987, and the National Trust uh, is very concerned with heritage sites. Um, in 1990 to 2006, there was a Marine Archaeology Committee um, every time uh, someone would come to the island wanting to um, try to extract treasure from, you know, somewhere, you know, look for treasure around the island, um, the Ministry of Culture would call on us and our group, the museum, uh, DOE, archive, trust and legal department did get together. We, we were an ad hoc mar marine archaeology committee and we did work, we laid the groundwork for establishing a new law uh, to replace the abandoned rec law. Uh, but at this stage it's still not come into being, uh, but perhaps one day it will. Um, in 1994, the Wreck of the Ten Sail Research, um, which was a, my PhD dissertation, I can tell you more about that than you want to know, <laughs> uh, resulted in a bicentenary uh, museum exhibit. Um, we had a, a publication with the archive that you can uh, purchase in the shop or at the National Archive. Uh, we had, there was a special postal stamp issue with the, the ships on, on the stamps, and a, a currency board coin was issued. Um, between 1990 and 2006, the museum employed an archaeologist, and that was, it ended up being me. Um, and we did work with um, government departments and other organizations, the DOE, Archive Trust, and we grew that inventory of shipwreck sites to about 140 sites. Then in 2003, uh, the Maritime Heritage Trail was launched by a, a formal por partnership of these groups. Um, in 2003 to 4, we also worked um, on the foundation to try to create the first shipwreck preserve at a ship called the Gloms that I'll show you some uh, images of a little later. But of course, then we had Hurricane Ivan and we had uh, and recovery and things got a little damaged and a little delayed. Uh, but hopefully we're back on track and we can get started and uh, make a run with the ball this time. So why did the Maritime Partnership create a Maritime Heritage Trail? Um, we've handed out brochures to you today so that you can see what, what we intended. Um, but I'll walk you through this a little bit and you can study those later in your armchair at home. We created it uh, because we thought it would be fun and educational for residents and visitors. We thought that even while people were having fun, it would increase protection and appreciation for the Maritime Heritage sites. It would empower people because people would become the protectors of the past and it would make a tourism attraction. So what's the value for the Cayman Islands? What is the benefit? Well, it's both cultural and monetary. Um, the, tra the trail uses existing resources. You don't really have to go out and buy shipwrecks. They're already there. You just interpret them. Um, or on land, you can uh, go to maritime attractions and, and they're accessible to all. It promotes the island's heritage, the history, and national pride. It encourages stay over tour tourism because to enhance the local economy because people have more things to do. It encourages travel around coastlines of all the islands. They don't just sit in one little spot, you know, um, in Seven Mile Beach. They go all around all three islands. It's a su sustainable tourism model and a new attraction for visitors. It encourages patronizing of the local businesses, all the restaurants, the hotels. Um, it's an effective interpretation of historical resources. It's a very creative management tool. If in, you, know, you don't have the legal mechanisms, it's a creative way to manage resources. And it provo promotes preservation of the island's history through education. Uh, the keys to success we felt like were, and we want to, to revitalize this, um, this cooperation, is bringing together experts, the government agencies, and the public. If everybody is on the side of the project, then it'll be a win-win. Um, keys to success, look, you know, you don't just have to reinvent the wheel. We, we looked at models in Australia and uh, Florida, the U.S. National Marine Sanctuaries, but we are not them 
Um, we are special and we have our own um, unique, you know, our, our, we, are a, we are a universe in three small islands. So we have, there, there are a lot of advantages uh, to that. So we developed our trail specifically for the Cayman Islands and we launched it in 2003. I think we, should, we will relaunch it in 2013. <laughs> <laughs> we just need to paint the signs and get, you know, get them, get, uh, replace a few of them you'll see around the islands. Um, it is what we plan to do. Um, anyway, we did create the trail um, focusing on, with two poster brochures on one for Grand Cayman and uh, the sister islands on their own uh, uh, separate uh, map. Now on Grand Cayman, there's like 20 sites and on each of the sister islands, there are eight sites. So you can drive around the island, you know, or you can sit in your armchair and just read your brochure. You don't have to even really go anywhere. But if you want to, you know, whether you're, you know, a visitor, a resident, a school child, a you know, church group, a tourist, a taxi driver, a bus driver, whatever, you can, uh, you can go around the island and you can stop at these places. And at each of these places, you can, there's like a, on your, the poster brochure, it's a poster on one side, on the back side, it's got a little blurb and a photograph that kind of tells you a unique the blurb about that um, particular site. So it's a land-based driving trail, signs and poster guides, and sites on all of the islands. And there are a variety of maritime sites. We talked a little bit about uh, kinds of sites before. Now this is um, Little Cayman, and that is Owen Island, um, and uh, you know, also Blossom Village. Maritime place names. Well, wh where do you think the Owen Island and Blossom Village got their names? Well, as it turns out, the second surveyor in the, in the uh, late 1800s gave names to these places, uh, attributing them to um, Richard Owen, who did the first Admiralty chart in 1831. So he was Richard Owen aboard HMS Blossom. And that is why we have Owen Island and Blossom Village. Um, lighthouses. We have, light, we have lights uh, on all of the islands. They're small, but, but uh, we have them on all islands. Um, they didn't come in until the late 1900s, however, you know, they're, um, but we, uh, rules and regulations concerning navigation and the protection of navigation uh, uh, essentially were the impetus for creating the lighthouses. Um, maritime architecture, there is no better place to see the skills of Caymanian shipwrights today than to go into some of the civic buildings like Elmsley Memorial Church, into the post office. Um, those are the places to go to see. Uh, it's almost like an inverted ship's hull. So um, you, it's, a, it's, a, it's a very important thing that I think people should see. Because we are founded upon the seas, we are a nation of shipbuilding and, and that kind of heritage, and we do still have it intact. Okay, so shipbuilding, again, uh, we may not have the, the ships uh, anymore, but we certainly have those cuts in the iron shore to show you where they were. Um, hurricane caves, we mentioned that a little earlier on the BRAC, they're, a, they're very important to the heritage of the islands and to the safety, really, uh, still today of BRACers. Um, forts, Fort George, the Fort at Prospect. Um, turtle fishing, uh, the turtles would be captured uh, all around the islands in Central America and Cuba and brought home to the Cayman Islands where fences were built in the sounds and the live turtles would be kept in these fences and then uh, they could sell live turtle to passing ships or consume it as they needed. Anchorages, the, this is uh, looking out at Bloody Bay Wall in Little Cayman and there's like a hole out there that's a really terrific anchorage and it has at least 12 anchors in it. Now, if you're you know, on a dive boat or something and you want to go for a second dive into a shallower area, what better thing than to <laughs> tour around this big bowl and see anchors, you know, 12 different anchors, you know, dating from colonial times to British Admiralty stock to schooner anchors, you know, and so forth. So, you know, there these are resources that are important in their own right, but they're also, you know, when people learn about them, it just makes their experience so much better. Early explorers, we've all already talked about Drake and Columbus. Maritime activities, we discussed careening. Well, that's how they did it. 
um, you know, in the North Sound, there's a place called the Careening Place, and uh, they would kind of haul the ship over on its side and uh, do it, you know, with anchors and uh, various ways of stabilizing it, and then they would clean the bottom of the ship and repair the bottom of the ship. And shipwrecks. Boy, do we have a lot of shipwrecks. As navigational hazards, um, we, we, we have quite a number. Pro probably more shipwrecks per capita than most places in the world. Um, on the left is the palace. Now, the palace was built in Scotland uh, in, the eight, in 1875, but she wrecked in 1910 under Norwegian flag off the, off the south coast. And then that's the East End Reef. Along that reef that we're looking at there, about three miles of reef, there are more than 30 wrecks. And 10 of those are from the wreck of the 10 sail that happened in 1794. We'll talk a little bit more about that uh, a little further on. So now that we're talking about shipwrecks, let's just focus a little bit on shipwrecks. 500 years of shipwrecks. So why am I showing this one? Well, this is a ship called the August. And the August wrecked at East End in the late 1800s, and she had sailed from Marseille. It just so happens that the, I think the second site that I saw at East End that our project in 1980 recorded was a, a wreck we called the Red Tile Wreck. And it had like 50, you know, forms of barrels of grout and all these red tiles that were marked Marseille. And I'm betting that that's the August. Now, she was actually built in Sweden, but she wrecked under Norwegian flag. Um, so, do we have a law about shipwrecks? Yes, we do. We have the abandoned wreck law of 1966. The 1997 revision was really just uh, commas and period type things. It wasn't really a, a, a full revision. Now, the problem, uh, you know, the, one of the problems with the abandoned wreck law, uh, in, in my point of view, is that it doesn't recognize shipwrecks as cultural resources. Um, it was really established uh, to ensure that government would re receive a percentage of any cargo that was salvaged from any ship that they gave to a prospector. The problem also was, however, that if a prospector was given a license, um, then they would get not less than half of the value of the wreck, but government could buy part of that back if they wanted to. Now, why would, would anybody want to, you know, give away what they had 100% of? And this government has actually over the years been very wise in that regard, and they have not issued any permits, unlike many other places in the world. Uh, we have not really issued permits um, for that. Um, one of the strengths of the law is it vests in the Crown all shipwrecks that have been on the seabed for at least 50 years. The strength, and we can use that to our advantage. Um, we hope that a new law is forthcoming that will recognize the full cultural value of shipwrecks in the not so distant future. Um, and one important thing is that we have, as I just mentioned, denied applications from treasure hunters. And, and we have actually, the government has actually uh, prosecuted for violations. So what should you do if you come across an artifact or a site? Well, you should leave it where it is. <laughs> take a photograph of it. Take a GPS coordinate and call me. <laughs> come to the museum. So again, you know, just looking at what are our resources around the islands. We have shipwrecks from uh, more than 14 countries. Uh, we have the the, the Caymanian vessels that are here are largely vessels that were, were lost in, um, in hurricanes, although other, there, have, there are other incidences. But we have accidental you know, ships from British and English ships, Dutch West, we have a Dutch West Indiaman, uh, Spanish ships, ships from the United States, Canada, Jamaica, Norway, Colombia, Honduras, Germany, France, Nicaragua, and Sweden. Why do we have so many wrecks? Well, again, before I had the picture on the screen, I was telling you a little bit about ocean currents moving in a big circle out in the Atlantic. Well, the one, the, as it comes across from Africa to the South America, that current does enter the Eastern Caribbean and moves right up through the Yucatan Channel. So ships, you know, the ships that are going from the Eastern Caribbean or from South America, or really, you know, uh, um, they could be coming from Europe, for all that matter, that come through the Caribbean. The easiest way to sail uh, out of the Caribbean is through the Yucatan Channel. 
you can beat against the currents through some of the other passages, but the, the most efficient way um, is right past the Cayman Islands, and that's why we were um, very good, you know, as landmarks and very good as, um, well, unfortunately, as navigational uh, hazards and the site of a great number of shipwrecks. So where are the wrecks located? Well, because we are the tip tops of great mountains that only protrude a very, very small, you know, height out of the ocean, lots of the ships wreck when they just flat run into us. <laughs> so uh, a number of our wrecks are located uh, in the reefs um, around the islands. Uh, there are also sites that are um, in the sounds where they were lost during storms. Now, George Gall's Admiralty Chart of 1773, which is the first Admiralty Chart of Grand Cayman, shows um, three, at least three wrecks. There's one at East End, the Cumberland Trans Transport, on the northeast end of the island. Something was called the Old Wreck. Um, and up here in the northwest um, area, the Augustus Caesar was lost here. So again, what kinds of ships? Well, covering that time period, we do have Dutch West, in we had a Dutch West Indiaman. Um, Spanish galleons have passed by. I know we have small, uh, a, a, a couple of, uh, a, a Spanish wreck um, in Little Cayman. Um, sloops, we have Jamaica sloops. HMS Jamaica was lost in 1715. Uh, she was on patrol from pirates from Jamaica when she was dismasted in a storm. And the pilot brought her to the Great North Sound where they were planning to refit her with a mast. Uh, however, she wrecked on her way um, into the North Sound and she's lost here. Frigates, like HMS Convert in the wreck of the tin sail. Schooners, the local schooners. Cat boats. Well, I don't know how many cat boats are wrecks, but we certainly have a lot of cat boats around these days, which is really good. And, and uh, d uh, I think it's very important what the Cat Boat Club is doing to revive um, the building of the cat boats and the regattas and that sort of thing. Uh, barks, again, here's the palace. So, we've looked at the, sh the, the land based maritime trail a little while ago. What about a second initiative. This is something that we've done the groundwork for but has not come into existence yet. We're thinking that a ship called the Gloms could be the Cayman Islands first shipwreck preserve. This is a ship that the documentary history is known. It was built in 1876 in Scotland and it wrecked under Norwegian flag in 1913 at East End. There's extensive site remains on the seabed um, and it's in shallow uh, located on a healthy reef in clear water. Now, why do we have such clear water here in the Cayman Islands? It's because we don't, one of the reasons anyway, is because we're a coral, you know, fossilized coral reef with no rivers. We don't have river runoff that muddies up anything. We're, we have crystal clear water, so even in shallow waters um, on a healthy reef, you can see very well. The ship has robust iron features. It's accessible by boat uh, to diving and snorkeling public. It has favorable uh, dive conditions and it's located off the east end of Grand Cayman. So now this is the Gloms and the Gloms, uh, this is when she was under Norwegian flag. But again, remember she was built in 1876 in Dundee, Scotland and when she was first built she was part of the Dundee Clipper Line. She was really, really fast. And she carried immigrants from Europe to Australia. That was one of her first jobs. Now, at, at a later date, when you know the steam power came in and so forth, that took over the the tra the, um, the immigration trade, and ships like Gloms that had had a great early sailing career, you know, as that type of vessel, uh, became sort of surplus. But the Norwegians in Norway at that time, the the Norwegians, many of the families formed single ship companies, and they bought a lot of these. Um, sailing vessels that had been built in, um, in Great Britain and they sailed them all over the world. We have a, a, a large number actually of Norwegian registered ships that are wrecked here in the Cayman Islands just because of that fact. So um, when we went out to map the remains of the Gloms, um, we got support from the maritime partners. So we had both human resources and operational resources. We had uh, great help from the East End dive operators, um, uh, 
local uh, family who had uh, diving children worked with us. Uh, Della Scott Ireton came from Florida and she worked with us. And we, did, we were able with this group to do professional site recording. This collaboration with others uh, uh, can result in some really good uh, work. Um, individuals would draw the individual artifacts. They would map their locations in relation to each other. They would identify objects. And they would be photographed. They would be videoed. And then they would be drawn. Um, here you see the Gloms, the porthole of the Gloms. Now we know a little bit about the story of the Gloms. I'll tell you in just a minute. But um, when she, uh, when they were trying to get her off the reef, she sunk down on her porthole, and it still lays right there. Um, I'm going to just walk in and give you a little sense. Um, this is a site plan of the Gloms. This would this would be offshore. So that way is, that way is to the island, OK? So up front here, uh, oh, the story of the Gloms. Let me tell you the story of the Gloms. That's what makes it so interesting. Um, the Gloms was sailing in a kind of a stormy night. And uh, the, the, as the light cleared, the, there were men up in the top of the rigging. Um, they noticed that there was the island present, but they didn't see any lighthouse. They, tried to haul the ship about to sail in the other direction. But what happened is they managed to get around, but they went backwards and they wrecked stern to the reef. So the ship was from the mid midship to the, you know, the whole stern was hard aground on the reef, but the, the bow was floating and it was even swinging. And they tried to sail her off the reef. So they, she was, was swinging back and forth and they never did get her off the reef. But the, the, from the bow of the ship, the front of the ship is the cut water. This is a part of the anchor chain. And actually out of the picture here is her bowsprit. So there's evidence that the, 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 you know, the, the bow end of the ship was pointing offshore. And then of course you've got the, the hull, the, the port hull falls down and uh, there's you know, other features, the stern features are towards the stern but it matches up with the story of the Gloms. So, you know, if you're taking a snorkeling tour around this site, you've had a nice deep dive, you know, off the wall somewhere, but you come in and you want to be diving between, say, um, 30 feet and, you know, and zero feet, um, and you could have a laminated site guide, um, you could have a brochure to read, you know, on land, and you could, it would just, uh, to know that story would just be a wonderful experience, I think. So, um, you know, as I'm mentioning, site interpretation. The marker on the right is an example from Florida. That's what they do. They have developed a whole series of these um, shipwreck preserves that they now have just renamed Museums in the Sea. And it's something that we could effectively do here in the Cayman Islands. Um, you could simply put a bronze plaque on a concrete marker, um, give the dive operators a little brush, or you know, sometimes you could put a lanyard in a brush and everybody who goes by just kind of cleans it off and can see the name of the ship and when it's sunk. Uh, you make the la laminated guide that the, the, the dive boats can give their customers as they you know, go out and see the features of the, the vessel. Um, or, you know, some, if, even, if, even if you don't dive, you can have an informational brochure uh, to learn about the story of the Gloms. But before we do this, we do have to be sure that the sites are legally protected and that they do have a management plan. Because even though it may look like a lot of rust out there <laughs> in the sea, it's really quite a valuable resource. Um, and you know, picking up pieces uh, of a puzzle and walking away with them means that you have no puzzle in the end. So it's very important to be sure that uh, people know what the rules are. So the Gloms could be a model for future preserves. Um, on the west end of Grand Cayman, there's a ship called the E.L. Banks that sunk, it did go down like in the 1940s. Um, and it was, uh, there's pig iron ballast, and it was a local schooner. Um, but there's, you know, quite an interesting site there and also um, in a very interesting environmental area as well. So people could go for a dive, see the coral reef, and also see the E.L. Banks. On Cayman Brack, there's the Prince Frederick, and the Prince Frederick is another one of our Norwegian shipwrecks. 
and there's Little Cayman, there's a Soto Trader. This is sort of a, a tragic story, but it was a, a local uh, uh, trader that uh, had, a, had an explosion. Uh, a person on board um, died, but it is in 50 feet of water and it is a dive site used in Little Cayman. It could be interpreted. The third initiative, rare sites. These are the sites that you can't just, you know, excavate and not, you know, uh, and then wonder what to do with all the bits and pieces that you've taken out of the sea. It's very important. Um, these sites exist nowhere else in the world. Uh, there's really nothing like them. They're very unique and uh, they're, these are a, a very special <coughs> resource for the Cayman Islands and there are many more really than we have listed here. I've just mentioned the turtle wreck um, from 1669 in Little Cayman, HMS Jamaica 1715 in the North Sound, uh, San Miguel 1730 Little Cayman, HMS Convert and the other nine ships of the wreck of the Ten Sail. So says, sensitive and fragile sites deserve special protection and research. While in situ preservation is always a first option, you can intervene if you have research or mitigation demands, but it, it does demand a range of obligations and responsibilities. You have to think about funding, having somebody who knows how to guide the project. You've got to document everything that you do. You have to conserve the material that you recover. You have to stabilize the site from which objects came if you've not excavated the whole site. You have to manage the collection and curate it. Uh, you are responsible for disseminating the information in publications or um, on in uh, public interpretations such as in the museums. So, well, that's all a lot of stuff. <laughs> But it can be done, um, and we, we should think about uh, actually by having an inventory of 140 sites, we might look at those sites and begin to say, well, how many of them are early sites? And sort of we have to make decisions you know, about how to use our resources. If we know what we've got, then we can make intelligent decisions <coughs> about them. In Little Cayman, the turtle wreck, why, why is this interesting? Well, um, when Henry Morgan sacked Portobello, it made the Spanish crown really angry. And they granted uh, reprisal commissions to a great number of people <laughs> who were sort of privateers, uh, I guess, in a sense. And uh, uh, they had reprisal commissions from the Spanish crown uh, to trouble English interests um, in retaliation for messing with um, uh, Portobello in Panama. So anyway, one of the reprisal commissions was given to one Captain Manuel Rivero Pardal. And instead of going straight to Jamaica, although he did get there later, um, he troubled interests of the English turtle fishing village in Little Cayman. He sailed up to South Hole Sound, which at that town was called Hudson Hole. And he had, uh, I believe it was five ships, four to five ships, and he had English flags or flying from his masts as he came upon, you know, all the vessels that were in the harbor there, and they were English vessels um, sitting there. And he began to fire on all these ships that, that were in the harbor. Well, the ships in the harbor, you know, put up English flags, and he pulled down his flag, his English flag, and he put up the Spanish flag and kept firing. And then, you know, he burned a number of the turtles' uh, sloops that were in the sound. Um, he did capture a couple of the vessels and, uh, and uh, you know, in the, the sound right now, in 1979 and 1980, an archaeology group did recover or discover remains of uh, a burned turtle fishing vessel. And this is a Spanish olive jar and part of a matchlock musket barrel um, that has broken the jar there. So it's uh, kind of interesting now. Manuel Rivero Pardal um, uh, wrote his note on a bit of sailcloth and he stuck it on a tree when he was troubling um, some interest in Jamaica and some of his, uh, you know, his, these bits and pieces that he has written um, are in archives in England even today. Okay, well another one, I'll just, uh, I'll tell you a little bit about the wreck of the ten sail and this one is special to me uh, because it was my PhD dissertation so I was sort of married to it for four years or five. <laughs> 
Anyway, um, the wreck of the ten sail. This was the wreck of ten sailing ships that all plowed into the East End Reef of Grand Cayman in 1794. You know, on the 8th of February, 1794 to be precise. Now, HMS Convert was the lead ship in this, in the, in the wreck of the ten sail, in the, in the convoy that was leading, um, well, it, HMS Convert, oh, let me start over. HMS Convert was really a captured French ship. The French ship had been called Long Constant and had been captured off of what is modern day Haiti. It was Saint Domingue at the time. It was France, it was a French ship. And this was the first year of the French Revolutionary Wars and one of the first captures um, the, uh, that was made. So they captured Long Constant, they brought her to Jamaica, and her first job was to sail with the, the merchant trade back to Europe um, to protect you know, all the rum and the sugar and that sort of thing. So there were 58 merchant ships along with the convert. So there were 59 ships in all. And the intention, as you can see, was to leave Jamaica, to sail, to see the Cayman Islands, to sight the Cayman Islands, to go through the Yucatan Channel, and then to sail across the Atlantic back to ports in Europe. But what ended up happening is the ships, well, let me just say, there were 59 ships in the convoy. The whole top row, 10 of the ships of that convoy all plowed into the East End Reef of Grand Cayman. That is the wreck of the tin sail. So there we have the East End Reef again, and if you can imagine in that three mile stretch, um, Captain Lawford, who did live to be an admiral eventually, um, here, uh, was the, he had just become a post captain, and the ships had sailed ahead in the night and a number of the merchant ships had actually struck the reef uh, before he even knew it. Um, he gave orders for the frigate to, you know, to, to come about. Um, he was fallen on board of by another merchant ship and uh, it took twice they tried to get disentangled and when the merchant ship got free, the convert didn't. It struck the reef and it uh, grounded along with several ships that had already were ashore. So as ca in Captain Lawford's own words, the dawning of the day presented a most melancholy scene with seven ships and two brigs on the same reef as the convert and a heavy sea running and the wind blowing directly on shore. So he was in a bad situation. Um, anyway, that is the wreck of the tin sail. Coming from shore, uh, many people came out in canoes. They did rescue um, the survivors. There were over 200 people on HMS Convert and perhaps up to 20 on each of the merchant ships. Um, one of the merchant ship captains died. He was on the, Br the Britannia. Um, and there were probably eight people that we know of who lost their lives in the wreck of the tin sail. But considering how many people had were in, in the shipwreck, it's a tribute to the, the Caymanian people that so many people were saved. Um, a number of the ships did go around to the west side of the island and they took on board a number of the survivors. But Captain Lawford stayed on shore with all of his officers and 30 of his best men um, and they salvaged what they could. Um, and then they sent a, an island schooner, an island vessel off to Jamaica. Um, the news ended up going to someone actually off of uh, St. Domingue and HMS Success came to the Cayman Islands and uh, carried Captain Lawford and what they could back to Jamaica, where he uh, had a court-martial, which is always standard in a, in a shipwreck, it, um, and he was <coughs> acquitted, and it was attributed to a strong northerly, to a strong current taking them to the north of the reckoning. So anyway, what's left out there in the ocean? Well, there are still parts of the ship. Um, this is an anchor that may well be the, uh, from the wreck of the tin sail, and actually that photograph, Mike Guderian in the audience there took that photograph many years ago. He was a volunteer on this project. Um, French cannons, again, we know that this was formerly Long Constant, HMS Convert was Long Constant. So here we have French cannons. It, you see on, down here it says 1781 and there's Fleur de Lis on that, uh, that band of that cannon. Um, on the trunnion, the end of the trunnion up there, you see the BA, that stands for Baynod. So actually there was a man named Baynod and he had 
his forge was at Forge Neuve on the River Charente in France, and we know exactly you know, who made these cannons and where they came from. And although uh, when we were surveying in the early 1990s and found 10 cannons on land, um, we did uh, in, in various states of, of, you know, not such great condition, but we did record them all. Um, in the sea, there are still more than 13 guns buried in a sandbar, and that is a site that, uh, that is, is uh, you know, no one is troubling it anymore at this stage. So, when you look in the sea, when you're surveying a site like this, one of the rare sites, you might, you know, look, uh, look down and you say, where is it? <laughs> because it's not always quite that easy to recognize. Sometimes a cannonball looks just like a piece of coral. You know, sometimes an iron ship fitting, you know, just, you know, looks like a, like a, like a loop of coral. I'm, this is a, this, that's a chain plate. That's part of the standing rigging, you know, uh, that would have held the, you know, the, the iron pieces that um, hold the, the rigging. So anyway, um, it's a learning to look do remove anything, any of any objects, which we did not remove these. These were actually two cannons that had been donated to the National Trust, one of which is from the wreck of the tin sail. Um, we try to uh, undertake proper conservation. Um, you have other opportunities. We were really fortunate uh, when we did this work on the wreck of the tin sail. Uh, the museum was able to have a a museum exhibition and it was the 200th anniversary and we didn't even know it you know when we planned it and uh, you know organized the exhibit but it was one of these times when then all of a sudden we learned that the Queen was going to be visiting in a month um, and it happened to be that we were able to uh, bring her into our little, our museum here and she was able to uh, now her husband did ask me why had they why had the fleet sailed through the Yucatan instead of going the other way. And I explained to him, and he's a good Navy man, yeah, I explained nice. it was ocean currents. I was <laughs> able to tell him, <laughs> and it made sense to him. <clears throat> so what future directions uh, might we take? Well, government does have clear legal jurisdiction over the seabed, including shipwrecks embedded in the offshore environment. That's quite an advantage to any historical site on land, which might be in private ownership. Uh, the National Museum could develop, further de develop, this Cayman Islands Maritime Archaeology Program, which has been sort of a long-term dream of mine. <laughs> uh, the Department of Environment could continue to provide an operational platform and serve as an essential link with enforcement and research. Already there is draft national conservation uh, legislation that provides a legal framework for the protection of sites uh, with special archaeological significance. And we can continue to work to achieve appropriate legislation. Maybe soon we will be able to get that back on track. And one of the benefits of having waited this long is that there are some international instruments out there now. Um, the ICOMOS uh, International Charter on the Protection Management of Underwater Heritage, which prescribes just generally best practice, and the 2001 UNESCO Convention, which is a, which is a legal document. Now, the Cayman Islands Maritime Archaeology Program could develop upon the foundations of maritime archaeology built over these past three decades, harnessing the unique data so that maritime tourism can be developed robustly as both culturally authentic and environmentally responsible. These maritime partners have got a three-tiered approach. It's pretty simple. Protect, manage, interpret the Cayman Islands Maritime Heritage Sites. And why do we want to do it? Well, I think that I probably, you know, said this already before, but understanding management and promotion of maritime heritage provides enjoyment and education for the public. <coughs> it encourages appreciation and protection for sites. It strengthens national identity and it enhances the economy through heritage tourism. This maritime heritage is important to the Cayman Islands it's important to the Caribbean region. It's important to the world. Thank you. <laughs> so before we head off,
outside. Does anyone have any questions that they'd like to to ask, <coughs> Doctor? Uh, just being from the Cayman Islands, oh. I mean from Bottom Town. Oh, okay. Uh, mm -hmm. I'm just curious. You didn't mention the wreck of the Iphigenia, and um, is that because it basically it was dismantled, or uh, it has no real? <laughs> And, and what no. about Bottom Town as a port well, back in the 1700s? Well, okay, let me answer Iphigenia first. You'll, I believe Iphigenia is probably on the, um, is on the um, Maritime Trail poster brochure. Uh -huh. You'll find that it is there. Now, I didn't mention a, a lot of sites because there's like 140 shipwreck sites. So I, I kind of gave you a kind of general overview of types of sites and I highlighted a few. Iphigenia is very important. Iphigenia is an extremely important site. What happened is, when she wrecked, it was the 1870s, right? I believe, I believe she wrecked, yeah, she wrecked in the, in the 1870s, like, don't hold me to this, but something like 1874. And she was overrun by salvers prior to her captain giving her up. Her captain was a Captain Boaz. And um, anyway, what happened, there were some legal proceedings that happened all around the Iphigenia. But soon after that came the, the formalized document giving specific instructions to receivers of wrecks on what to do in the event of a shipwreck. So that was, the Iphigenia is important because <coughs> right after that incident occurred, the legislation, you know, uh, came into being that gave precise instructions as to how a shipwreck should be handled. So it's important, and I believe that it is on the maritime trail. Well, I'm just curious that Bond Town obviously isn't going to. I mean, at one point in time, it was a port, wasn't it? So well, uh, what happened? What changed? Well, um, I, I often hear people talk about Bodden Town being a port. Um, and I'm, I'm sure that, uh, I mean, Bodentown, I think probably William Bodden did live in Bodentown, um, and he was a principal person, and I'm sure that their island schooners could, uh, could enter, enter the reef there. Um, the major, the place that big ships could anchor, like a, like, a, like a British warship or something like that, would have to be off the west end of the island. Um, the, you have to have a smaller draft ship, like a sloop or a schooner, um, to get into the, the sounds. So, I, I mean, I think that Bodden Town can have been the capital, you know, uh, but not necessarily the major port. I mean, at the west end of the island, it was the hog styes. This is where you could, um, the, they kept hogs and ships would come where they would wood and they would water and they would take on board. Um, so, you know, uh, that's, that's, <laughs> uh, yeah, yeah, no, it's, it's, uh, every part of this island is important and has a story and that, that's the whole point. The whole point is that it's a, in, in my view, it, it's a great untapped resource, you know, um, there's so much about the history um, that that can benefit education, culture, and tourism. And if you make it a win-win-win, then you kind of, different people see the world in different ways and you can make it attractive to, to everybody. So anyway, thanks for those questions, so we're good. <laughs> yes? Yeah, I, I remember reading in pa uh, the paper some article about it, and it, uh, there was something taking place at a location that came in called Portuguese Bay. And in your talk, uh, the Portuguese were never mentioned. Can you comment on where Portuguese Bay is and, and uh, to what extent there might have been Portuguese in this part of the Caribbean? Actually, I'm, I'm, I don't know of a site called Portuguese Bay, so any information you have on that would be, you know, is something that we should pursue. Um, Manuel Rivero Pardal, the guy who had the reprisal commission, was Portuguese. Yeah. <laughs> so that's, you know, one, one thing that I know. Yes, certainly it could be. I, I said Spanish, Dutch, French, English, but I could have said Portuguese, you know, as in terms of people um, navigating Europeans through the Caribbean. Yeah, there's a lot of to and fro between the 
Portuguese and Spanish crown, so it yeah. could have been all mixed up at one stage. Right. Yeah. I thought it had to do with the, uh, the demarcation line, and that's why, uh, for example, Brazil is Portuguese because mm -hmm. it sticks out in the Atlantic, and anything west of that was Spanish. Talk about that's the Treaty Tessador. Yeah, I guess. And then the Spanish came over the Caribbean and then ultimately in Mexico and all that. So I thought that was the difference. I think. And that's why I don't think it was mm -hmm. not I think I've heard was, a lot of Portuguese in the Caribbean area area versus in South America and so on. Not, I know Robert uh, is <coughs> from Bermuda and he Bermuda has a lot of Portuguese yeah, ba background and, and you've got of, some uh, Portuguese in uh, Jamaica and then you've got uh, many people in Cayman and Portuguese heritage, but it's not very well documented, although a few people will have uh, documented the name uh, the Costa is a Portuguese name. It's okay. actually the Sephardic Jewish name, and the Jews were uh, the Sephardic Jews who were apparently in the Caribbean before the Spanish came. Uh, they had also, um, during the time of Inquisition, they were forced up to Holland and took them in, and then they actually financed New Amsterdam or New York, and then some of them ended up in Jamaica and other parts of the world. Robert, may I challenge you to find out more and help us yeah, yeah, yeah. find our Portuguese know, roots? Yeah. <laughs> I just, uh, somebody gave me a book on um, Jewish pirates. <coughs> oh, really? Yes. It would have been undoubtedly Sephardic Jews. You know, if they were Spanish or Portuguese, they both be, would be Sephardic. Mm -hmm. yeah. Thank you. Is Bloody Bay associated with Captain Harry and Manuel Pardell Rivera, or is it something separate? If so, what, what was it? Is it all, an old name? Um, you know, Simon, that's a hard question. Um, you know, Roger Smith, who was a project director on the 79 to 80 project, has hypothesized that Bloody Bay may have been named for the, the really, the invasion, you know, that happened by Manuel Rivera Pardal. But the historical <laughs> documents, of course, show that on the, the south side of the island. Um, I can't, you know, I, I don't really know. And we, 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 to this day, I, I have not seen um, historical records that talk about Bloody Bay precisely. But one thing I have noticed is there's like a Bloody Bay in Jamaica, just like there's a Savannah and there's a Pedro and there's a, you know, some of the place names, you know, it, it makes me wonder, uh, you know, that more needs to be done in looking at place names. Looking at place names, um, there's an area of reef in North Sound called Kidman's Reef. Uh, I know that there's going to be a slave ship that went down. A lot of the slaves died on the ship. I'm wondering whether is it possible Kidman's Reef? Has there been any search to see if there's any sort of slave artifacts in the North Sound? Yeah. Okay. Um, I have, I have not heard of that that name. Um, I have heard that there was a ship called the Nelly. You know, I think, it, you know, in one of the history books it mentions the Nelly, you know, having, having wrecked. Um, but again, I, I have never seen the historical documents to go with that. But these are stories that would be very important to, to society here. I mean, let me just mention one thing. For instance, in, um, in the Turks and Caicos Islands, they are <coughs> the, a group called Ships of Discovery is, was searching for a ship that the English called Troubadour. It's probably really the Spanish, Spanish word Troubadour. But this was a ship that um, was um, sailing after slavery was abolished in English territories. I think it was, you know, the 1840s. Um, but this ship had on board a cargo intended for slavery in Cuba, but it wrecked in the Turks and Caicos Islands, and the authorities took over, and those people ended up being freed. You know, and the, the history of that, some of the history was lost, but it's being rediscovered now, and they're finding that there's communities that can trace their roots um, to, to this wreck, and the, how profound that was for, for those people and for that country. So, uh, there's lots of stories. It was very interesting uh, feeling about the ten sails. I'm sure your PhD would be uh, interesting to look at. I had no idea that there were all those extra ships. Oh. And did they did they all get back safely? 
Mm -hmm. Did the four fifty nine altogether? So did the forty nine? Uh, well, you know, um, there was the, the, the list of the ships that were in the convoy uh, was lost because when Captain Lawford uh, left the convert, he was in a, a vessel that was supposed to come through the reef, but a big wave carried them over the reef and he lost a lot of his papers and so forth. But um, I was able to reconstruct the ships of the convoy by looking at arrivals at ports in Europe and, and departure, departures from Jamaica and arrivals in Europe. And so I pretty kind of reconstructed in my dissertation the, all of these ships and tried to follow what had happened to them. Um, one ship, the leaky ship, went to Havana and then, um, so that, that ship ends up, I think, going up, up to the coast of the United States. There was a leaky ship that delayed the convoy, which goes to, you know, Cuba and then, then elsewhere. And then most all of the other ships made it back except one ship, and her name was the Peggy. <laughs> and she was captured and taken into to a port in France. Any more questions? Yes? Uh, my wife's going to kill me on this one. Oh, but yeah. <laughs> Treasure Island out front. We live in uh, Bottentown on the beach on Mance Road. And um, uh, I go out and collect the trash. And when mm -hmm. you get bend over and you get your nose closer to the ground, you see mm -hmm. a lot of things. Mm -hmm. I keep picking up these black stones mm -hmm. that are very you know, round and smooth mm -hmm. and flat. and mm -hmm. and. It, you know, I, I, there's a geologist right down the street from us, mm -hmm. and I've asked him, what is this, and he hasn't really answered. And so, coming back from a trip overseas, we stopped in London, and I had my uh, back massage, and they finished up with these hot stones on my back, mm -hmm. and they were identical. And mm -hmm. so it led me to believe that these must be the stones from the ballast of the ships that came from Europe or mm -hmm. whatever, and, and are a result of the wrecks off of Baden Town. You are a budding archaeologist. <laughs> <laughs> I know, I've never been, but this is, so this is my logic, and, and no one has been able to. What, oh yeah, when they dug up the, for the boat ramp in Baden Town, they also found a ton of them too. Yeah. So, and, I mean, this island is basically limestone. This is not limestone. Exactly. Limestone. The Cayman Islands are a fossilized yeah. coral reef. Right. Um, you know, as the sea levels have gone up, the coral has grown up, and when sea levels go down, it's exposed, dies as a coral reef, and it's, that's what the island is. It's happened, and it's happened more than once. So, basically, you know, we're just a Swiss cheese of limestone coral reef, um, which where sediment has, you know, right. formed and so forth. Um, so anytime you find a rock <laughs> like that black stone, right. you know, I always, you know, it, it makes underwater archaeology really easy here because, you know, in other places you have to consider where might the source be. Right. But here it's just quite, um, right. quite well, common that it is from a shipwreck. Filling the bottom of the ship with ballast mm -hmm. and they're carrying baskets, not a big stone, mm -hmm. but a lot of small stones, I mean, you're still mm -hmm. going to get the same weight. And so See, that location is probably a place, um, a ship could have been careened there. When you're careening a ship, you've got to, you know, kind of take off the ballast and that sort of thing. But also, when you are, you take off ballast and you maybe put on cargo, and, and Cayman did export things like right. co cotton, wild cotton, and, you know, other things um, from the island. So you would, you would offload the rocks and you would unload, you know, the cargo. Good question. The old people told me, I don't know whether it's Wilson Moore <coughs> or that one by the beginning of Lance Road, but they said in one, a monkey came ashore, and then the other one, a young girl died in the wreck. One had a monkey come ashore on it, oh. and the other one, a young girl died. I'm not sure which is which now. But uh, I remember the old people telling me that. So it's mm -hmm. funny that they, you yeah, I mean, if you if you go down to East End, you know, you see an anchor fluke as you're kind of going in. Have you ever seen that one sticking out of the water? That that's probably the Inga, uh, but in oral histories that 
you know, I got many years ago. People said that's how rats got to East End, you know, on that ship. <laughs> <laughs> Anyway. <laughs> yeah, I um, haven't found any of those. <laughs> Anything else, folks? What about the people who used to go along the beach with the metal detectors? Are they still permitted under the, the laws of whether you can take things from the shores of, of Cayman? Well, um, the, the abandoned wreck law includes flotsam, jetsam, lagan, and derelict. So, you know, if, uh, if it's shipwreck material that's in the beach area, then people shouldn't be, be, be taking it. We, um, we do not have formal laws uh, about metal detectors, but it, we, you know, um, anyway. Um, so, you know, in, in some cases, people with metal detectors have been a big help to us. Uh, you know, when we've been mapping sites like the wreck of the tin sail, the, the cannons that are buried in the sandbar, we didn't dig those up. We identified them by um, metal detector and by little pro by probes, you know, digging just a little hole to, to determine we had the cascabel and the, you know, so uh, they're... And um, on some of the rescue sites that we've had on land and chasing bulldozers, um, you know, we've had people have been our allies. Uh, one thing we certainly don't want to do is have people from overseas bring metal detectors, you know, onto the island and, and the, that sort of thing. The folks who are here are to be our allies. Okay, well, guess what? We have some nice refreshments outside. Maya, do you have anything else to, <laughs> to sure. say? I mean, um, Dr. Peggy has some books here as well that she's written chapters in, so if anybody does want to have a look at those, please help yourself. And we have some refreshments out in the courtyard for you. And if you do want to take a look around the museum as well, feel free to. Thank you all for coming very much. Thank you. Thank you. And I'll just give a final note, a thank you to, to GIS here who have been covering our speaker series. And they're um, actually uh, on their website, you can go to see this again a second time on YouTube. Cool. Yeah. And, uh, and it's airing on the local television station occasionally as well, or our um, previous speakers have. Oh, uh, and one final remark I will make is next week, in two weeks, we have another speaker, and it's going to be Henry Muto in our audience today. And he's going to talk all about traditions of carnival. It's going to be very interesting. And other carnival. Yeah. So, so please come back and, and join us. Thank you so much. I'm so happy that we had such a nice uh, turnout tonight. Thank you.